Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Good evening. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover, and I'm excited to have with me this evening Delegate Ibrahim Samira, who represents the 86th District here in Virginia. Delegate, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me, Lindsay, and uh, everybody else at uh, Inside Scoop. Pleasure to be with you all. Well, we love having you on the show. So we're excited to be able to have this conversation with you because we know you are going to be going into special session come August 18th. So it's been a few months, obviously, since we've been able to get together. A lot has happened. Um, but will you just briefly start out with some of your big accomplishments that you had uh, coming out of regular session? Running into my first full regular session, uh, so much got done in such a short time frame. Uh, I was able to pass five pieces of legislation that are uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think the most important one for me was, uh, on a personal level, was passing uh, the bill to tell medical providers to always look for uh, uh, prenatal and postnatal uh, depression uh, and soon to be or uh, new mothers, uh, because that's something that has plagued so many families uh, in such a negative way for many years uh, and gone untreated can cause massive uh, harm to not just the mother, but the entire family. Uh, another uh, big piece of legislation that I passed was actually one that uh, addressed our housing crisis, uh, specifically houses that uh, are not being used uh, to allow localities uh, to charge fees uh, if they are considered to be bad uh, properties, meaning properties that reduce property value for a neighborhood and furthermore cause people to run away from a neighborhood. Uh, so got myself started with a few uh, piece of legislation. Um, I think the fun, the, the most, uh, 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 the most legislation that was quote unquote controversial was I passed the bill to raise the minimum age for when you could receive, uh, sun tanning, uh, uh, artificial sun tanning, uh, in and, and sun, uh, uh, in tanning salons. And uh, it was a bit controversial because uh, I think people remembered uh, me for protesting Donald Trump. And uh, they thought that I was uh, raising the minimum age as uh, kind of a backdrop on the fact that Trump uses a lot of uh, sun tanning uh, chemicals or facilities, whatever he uses, <laughs> who knows. Uh, uh, but it was it was a very important one for me as well because melanoma is extremely dangerous when you're young. Uh, skin cancer is pervasive, uh, especially at a young age, and uh, representing uh, a lot of folks in my generation who don't know uh, that this is a bad thing and wouldn't know better, uh, I, I felt the urge to raise the minimum age for that. Uh, besides all of that, a lot of work on raising the minimum wage, uh, working to uh, create more uh, power for unions uh, to organize, uh, making sure that we uh, get rid of uh, outdated racist white supremacist language in our, our code, uh, working on uh, health care protections, uh, working on uh, just about everything that you can imagine. Uh, we're catching up with the times for 20 solid years, of course, passing the ERA, not to forget that. I mean, I could go on and on. I'm going to stop uh, because... <laughs> then we're going to keep going on and on and about the great stuff that got passed, but there's still so much more to do as you can imagine. Well, and several of your bills have such an emphasis on healthcare. Um, and that's obviously what you specialize in. So it's incredible to see you taking your talents the way you are straight to Richmond and working on behalf of all of us when it comes to healthcare issues. It's the most important thing of our time right now. Uh, it was the most important thing of for Virginians before the pandemic, uh, but you can imagine the amount of importance that it has now after the pandemic. Uh, from a from a public health perspective, we are dealing with some massive issues uh, with regards to the affordability of healthcare. 
uh, almost 50% of Virginians skipped out on serious medical treatment last year, which means that these are people that if they were to be uh, having systemic diseases uh, in their bodies, that in combination with a COVID-19 infection, they have a much higher likelihood of passing away. Uh, we have to act on that uh, because we can't let Virginians, hardworking Virginians, specifically Virginians on the margins who are disproportionately impacted by the high cost of healthcare to be hit even harder uh, during a pandemic that's probably going to happen once in our whole lifetime. Uh, and, and so I, I'm very much focused on that uh, going into this special session, uh, in addition to focusing on it from an equity lens, focusing on uplifting brown and black people in the context of healthcare, in the context of public health, for the benefit of everybody, all and all. Well, that sounds fantastic. And I know that during the show, we're going to talk about these issues more in depth. But I know since we saw you last, uh, last that you were on the show, you mentioned our world has changed so much. I mean, for one, we're not in a studio right now. We're both uh, doing this remotely because we are all working through a global pandemic. And so talk a little bit about from your perspective and what you're hearing from your constituents are the challenges that people are really facing right now, whether it be education or economics. Talk a little bit about what you're hearing from your constituents on that front. Gosh, every single day I get calls about unemployment benefits, uh, people needing them, uh, whether it be uh, financial uh, from the, uh, you know, an unemployment paychecks that get handed out for people who are unable to uh, secure a job, uh, to people who, who, uh, losing their job means that they lost their health care, uh, plan, their health insurance plan, and now they have to, uh, resort to Medicaid. Uh, and, you know, with that has been such a renewed focus for me on tackling it tackling head on the issue of uh, the issues that have exacerbated the pandemic. Uh, it was actually March 9th, 2020, the last day of regular session, when I stood up and made the last speech of the 2020 regular session. And in it, I asked Governor Northam to convene a special session to address our public health system problems that are facing our constituents. It would soon be uh, uh, these same constituents fighting the virus with their own bodies. And so as a doctor, my mind was racing, building diagnoses of and treatments for the most significant public health diseases that would hold us back from eliminating COVID-19. And uh, that led me to, uh, uh, you know, work in the off season afterwards to make sure that we had a special session. Uh, very appreciative that Governor Northam and Speaker Filler Corn have moved forward with the idea of a special session uh, to address not only the public health problems, uh, in the way of fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, but also to address another pandemic, the pandemic of systemic racism that people of color face in public health. So they deserve uh, appreciation for that, uh, but we also, now we must talk. Uh, millions of Virginians cannot afford uh, to be healthy, and we must begin to reverse this corrupted reality through the passage of a public option into law and making Medicaid or Medicare for all who want it also uh, inevitable. And that is because it's no secret that the extremely high healthcare costs are hurting all of Virginia's working families, public health, especially those on the margins. Absolutely, absolutely. And what the points you brought up are so incredibly important and long overdue, right? Um, but this pandemic that we're working through, um, as you mentioned, on the health front, but also on social justice front, right, is really calling for some important policy during this moment to ensure that people's voices are heard. So let's talk a little bit about what your priorities are going to be as you prepare to go into special session. Sure. And I, I take to heart all the uh, movement on uh, anti-racism that has happened in our society at large in the United States, but also in Virginia. Uh, we saw so many protests happen in the, in the state's capital in Richmond against the legacy of white supremacy there, 
uh, Richmond being the former capital of the Confederacy, of the old Confederacy. Uh, I myself in our Northern Virginia region went downtown to DC and was protesting in front of the White House. I got tear gassed. Mm. I was blinded for five minutes. Uh, you know, really seeing people put their lives on the line to confront racism, to confront systemic injustice was extremely empowering for me going into thinking about special session, going into thinking about how am I going to translate my ask for a special session uh, into something uh, that's tackling systemic injustice mm -hmm. and using my expertise in healthcare. Uh, so I was, I was referring earlier to uh, pushing for a public option. Mm -hmm. And what is a public option? Option uh, is uh, uh, in many ways our only way forward on a state level, given the many federal regulations that control uh, 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 healthcare policy. Uh, while Medicaid expansion has been a crucial relief of that burden for those families making under 138% of the income federal poverty line, there are still close to 300,000 Virginians who fall into the coverage gap between qualifying for Medicaid or Medicare and having private insurance. Millions more Virginians are paying way too much for their healthcare coverage. And mm -hmm. as proof of this healthcare crisis, as I mentioned earlier, last year, 50% of all Virginians said they or a family member had to skip out on a serious medical care because they couldn't afford it. This was before we had an economic recession and pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, as a result, our Virginia economy is not going to be able to handle uh, as much of the burden. Uh, we have already lost 2,500, uh, approximately that number, disadvantaged Virginians to this public health crisis. These disadvantaged Virginians are disproportionately coming from economically distressed backgrounds, but also are disproportionately black and brown. So imagine what uh, is happening to so many uh, black and brown people that are facing so many problems on a day-to-day -day basis uh, culminating in such a vivid moment where we saw George Floyd uh, being choked to death mm -hmm. and Breonna Taylor uh, being killed without any means for justice. Uh, imagine how much more they're going through because of all these compiled situations that are piling up. Uh, when Virginians are skipping out on treatment in the midst of a national coronavirus pandemic due to justifiable fears of the cost of treatment. So while I had not had uh, much time in the legislators, every legislative member uh, of mine, a colleague of mine, uh, as a medical practitioner uh, working in predominantly white and economically disadvantaged working class areas, I know firsthand how many Virginians are skipping out on treatment every single day because of the cost of health care being too high. So why, uh, uh, what can we do? Because of the poor health care protections that our most vulnerable Virginians have, a public option must be offered to all Virginians that may need it as part of a comprehensive treatment plan to protect them against death. I will give the two reasons why a public option is absolutely necessary. Number one, a public option would provide truly affordable insurance coverage for every Virginian, for any Virginian that would like to take it. Number two, a public option would offer cost-saving plans without the need to raise taxes. And number Three, actually, if I may add a third reason, is that this is a health care plan that has been hashed out since 2007. It was part of the original Affordable Care Act proposal that then candidate Barack Obama had campaigned on. And then when Barack Obama was elected, President Barack Obama was unable to pass as part of the Affordable Care Act. It was a central piece of the Affordable Care Act uh, policy that he was proposing for us as a nation. And since it's been hashed out for over 13 years now, I think it's long overdue, especially in the middle of a pandemic, to pass this, to protect our constituents from the harms of the biggest public health problem we have in Virginia, the massive uninsurance and underinsurance that millions of Virginians are going through in the middle of a once in a lifetime pandemic. Well, I mean, time and time again, you know, we have had activists on to interview. Uh, so many of us have been ourselves protesting in the streets. And I think the number one question I always hear are our elected officials actually 
listening to us. And as you just laid out your priorities for this special session, I can confidently say you are a legislator that is listening to the people in the streets right now because these protests are going forward, whether we're in a pandemic or not. And people are so outraged by the injustice and how long overdue these reforms are. And I want to hear a little bit. You referenced your experience in D.C. And I would love for you to tell a little bit more about that, what it was like for you to be in the middle of that and obviously, you know, not be able to see for five minutes being sprayed with with the tear gas. Can you tell us a little bit about that moment for you and kind of the fear in the streets, but also the activism and the passion to ensure that we get this right? I did not intend on getting tear gassed. <laughs> I'm going to put it simply. I went down to the White House because it was the nearest mass protest that was happening to my district in Herndon. Uh, Herndon is a metro district. Mm -hmm. uh, I you know, drove down uh, and parked my car and was just wanted to see what was happening from afar because I assumed there wasn't many going to be many legislators or many elected officials for that matter in the area to watch over these protests. They were still in the beginning days of the protests happening. And knowing uh, my organizing experience, I knew that the moments when most violence happens in these kind of spaces where people are fighting for justice happens actually right in the beginning of the movement building. And I was just standing afar on the, uh, the street side of Lafayette Square and began seeing police officers from DC police start pushing up against protesters to the point where they were taking apart the 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 uh, uh, the guardrails that were put in place between the pro between the police and the protesters and attacking these protesters and I'm sitting here thinking to myself what is going on. I mean, this is reminiscent of growing up in a uh, country uh, that is considered uh, an authoritarian regime, uh, like the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And experiencing that in the United States where I knew I had protections, I had First Amendment protections that, pr that protected my right to speak up against anything, and especially injustice. And then on top of that, the usage of tear gas in a indiscriminate way. Uh, they were punch, they were pumping out tear gas through these uh, machines that I've never seen uh, that were like those that you would see at a Six Flags pumping uh, mist down on people to cool them down. So it wasn't like it was a tear gas, you know, in one area only. It was going to everybody. And, and, and you, you, you could been, have been half a mile away from it and you would have still been choking up and losing your sight. And that's, this is, this is a very reminiscent of tactics that we ashamedly use halfway around the world when we're killing people in our wars. And we always regret doing that. And here we're using it against our own citizens. And so as somebody who is biracial, who comes from also a identity that is black, I, I couldn't bear to think this is absolutely an attack on not just my freedom, but also the ability of my people to live, period, just to live. And it was taking place in the most physical form that I could have, that could ever imagine in, the, in, the, in America at that very given moment in the middle of a protest. And it was extremely hurtful, especially after later on learning that these Tear gas uh, 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 chemicals actually cause long-term harms to people's bodies. So I'm not exactly sure what, you know, how how the bodies of people that were on those front lines protesting the injustice are going to turn out in the future. But I am not excited to find out. Uh, and and it, and again, it's such a you know an important thing to remember for me going into this special session because we we have to demilitarize the police. We have to. Uh, 
start stopping specific police practices and putting our money more into uh, public health practices that actually prevent crime. Uh, we need to put more money into uh, making sure we have mental health resources for our most vulnerable, our children. We need to make sure that we are tackling uh, issues of education uh, head on so that people uh, don't end up uh, in situations where they are having to resort to violence or crime to get to get through life. Uh, we need to be able to protect everybody from violence, not just from the tail end of things, not just by patching it up and putting a Band-Aid on through policing, but from the very get-go, from the structures that we have in place that are meant to protect people and to make sure that they're protecting people on the margins the most. I mean, it's incredible that you experienced that in what you might say is the center of, you know, democracy, of freedom, right? The nation's capital. And that's how people were being treated in the streets. And, you know, while it's so disheartening and just horrific, honestly, it also gives me a little hope that people kept coming back, right? That people are still protesting because these changes are so incredibly important to the people in our country and the fabric of our very nation. And so I love hearing how you are taking that experience down to Richmond with you, because I think that is the fear as you know, we're talking to more and more people in the community is that voices aren't going to be heard the way they should be heard and band-aids are gonna be produced in Richmond versus actually fixing many sources of the problem. And it sounds like you are more interested in fixing the problem than putting a band-aid on it. Absolutely, I, I think that we have a lot of things that we can solve uh, through stitches than band-aids. And we, we absolutely have the ability to heal these wounds fully. And it requires courage and it requires understanding the responsibility one has as a legislator with the power of the button of yay and nay. I, I, I absolutely think that uh, you know, these, these two buttons are extremely powerful to make a huge difference in people's lives when, when used in the right way. And right now we are not fully there yet. Uh, and we're gonna hope that the legislator comes together to produce long lasting change rather than changes that are only in the moment, uh, that we think long ahead of how it is that our country got to where it is and how we can prevent the country from going in the same direction again. It requires us to perfect the very principles that this country was founded on. They, were, they have not been perfected. Our founders did not perfect them. Everybody since then has not perfected them. And it's our duty to make sure that this young nation rises above the fray and realizes itself before we lose our status as the most powerful nation in the world. We have to realize our true potential for changing the way the world functions, starting locally. It's, it's not a cliche that all politics start locally. And, and I firmly believe in that as, as an elected official at the state level, even though I believe in all these big ideas of change on an international level. And especially when you're in Northern Virginia in the vicinity of DC and in, in a very worldly place, my district, 41% of the residents of my district are foreign born. Uh, and it's easy to think about the big things, but it's also more important to remember that nothing changes if you can't change your community for the better. Nothing changes if we can't change ourselves for the better. And it requires us to step up and confront a lot of these realities of corruption that we have internal to our system and not to be afraid to challenge them uh, because, of because of fear of change. Uh, change is sometimes, can sometimes create worry, but you can survive it with lots of minds being courageous together. And I look forward to utilizing the wisdom of a lot of my, uh, uh, the folks that I look up to in the legislature that have been lo around longer than I have. However, I need to bring in the fresh perspective of the youngest elected official uh, in the legislature to them. Uh, and and I, hope, I hope that they will receive it, uh, especially since I'm bringing it from the front lines on the streets. 
You absolutely are. And you nailed it when you said it requires courage, right? It requires courage from our elected officials to meet this moment because as citizens, we're demanding it. And that's the question I have for you. Are you confident going down to Richmond that elected leaders are ready to come with courage to meet this moment right now? I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I think that politics is always unpredictable. Uh, there's so many great things that have happened through government, through representative government that were totally unexpected. Um, take just the civil rights movement of the 60s. Mm -hmm. I mean, before the Civil Rights Act was passed, a year before that, uh, the country had voted in somebody who was going to protect the status quo, that was going to protect segregation. But Martin Luther King, John Lewis, and everybody else with them persisted. They didn't give up. They did, they did so many actions and they got thrown into prison so many times, but only a short time frame after they were sitting in the White House watching the signing of the Civil Rights Act through the pen of the same person that said that they wouldn't get any civil rights to desegregate. And so I, I, I believe this stuff is, is when this stuff happens when there are big moments of change happening in our society. And right now we're really in the midst of something really big. We have a racial moment of racial reckoning nationwide, but also we have a moment of understanding the systemic nature of disease, a pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, and what it does to us as Americans and to our life as we, as we know it. Well, your courage is infectious and it's inspiring. And so my hope is when you're in Richmond, that you can inspire the elected leaders around you because the change you're talking about is the change that our communities are demanding at, at this moment. And, and I would say long overdue, right? Um, but I know we are gonna continue our conversation about these important issues. Um, and thank you for being with us again this evening. Please stay with us, we will be right back. Let me tell you about the toughest guy on earth. He does the work of two jobs, but only gets paid for one. He's tough enough to feed the man who gave him a lifetime of nourishment. <clears throat> he has the crazy strength to lift the man that raised him up without even flinching. That's right, no employee of the month bonus check here. This guy, no. This boy will always be by his father's side, even if his dad will hardly remember. Good luck finding a gym to train for that. If this guy isn't the toughest guy on the planet, then I don't know who is. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Even though there is so much against us, you will see me wearing a face covering. And even with my face covered, you will see me as a son, as a friend to everyone I meet, as a fighter for change, as a woman who stands up for what I believe in. So join me in wearing a face covering to help stop the spread of the coronavirus. Because this is one small act of kindness that has the power to bring us all together. Neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. 
My heart, My heart doesn't, doesn't see race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. Our fight against coronavirus isn't over. Let's wear face masks in public. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines. And wash our hands frequently. Let's move forward together. Learn more at coronavirus.gov. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover, and we're continuing our conversation this evening with Delegate Ibrahim Samara, who represents the 86th District here in Virginia. Delegate, thank you again for being with us. We had such a great conversation in the first segment, and again, inspiring to hear how you are taking um, the activism and just meeting the moment right now. Uh, as you head down to Washington. So or, I'm sorry, not to Washington, to Richmond rather. Um, but thank you again for being with us. And I want to continue our discussion because I think it's such an important one. We are hearing all these different things about criminal justice reform, ensuring that you know we ab are able to better train our police officers and all sorts of police reforms. Can you talk about what some of this looks like, um, because I think it's important that we break it down. When people talk about defunding the police, for example, there is a lot of misconceptions out there about what that means and ensuring that people really understand the goal of some of these reforms and how they're gonna be done, I think is really important. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, we held uh, in the General Assembly so far, uh, I think three public hearings where we, we tried to get as much uh, information from the public about what uh, they believe is needed uh, to uh, confront the justice system's uh, systemic uh, discriminations. Mm -hmm. And we heard from a lot of different uh, uh, people that care a lot deeply about it. But also we heard from organizations that care deeply about it. And there is a series of issues that uh, we, we came up with. And uh, just to go over them real quickly, there's uh, laws regarding expungement of policing court records that we need to reform so that uh, we have uh, police records. We have to uh, increase good behavior sentence credits. Uh, we have to strengthen prosecutorial ability to dismiss charges. We have to eliminate qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. We have to prohibit no knock warrants. We have to ban the use of chokeholds and other lethal restraints used by law enforcement. Create a statewide Marcus alert system, which is uh, for those that have mental illness, they should be seen by a mental health professional rather than a police officer if they are uh, in unsafe uh, situations. Uh, we have to strengthen our laws related to civilian uh, review panels over police misconduct and other issues that relate to police. Uh, eliminating certain pretextual police stops, things like uh, preventing stopping of police uh, due to marijuana smell. Uh, and uh, we need to demilitarize our police department, something like I, we were talking earlier, I, near and dear to my heart as somebody who uh, who was harmed by the militarization of police departments through their usage of tear gas uh, and beyond. Uh, and we need to ban uh, th crazy things that happen also that people uh, don't know that are not uh, unlawful, like sexual relations between officers and arrestees. That's legal uh, in Virginia. Uh, we need to empower the attorney general to conduct uh, pattern or practice investigations, as they're called, of police forces that appear to be violating constitutional rights, uh, including unlawful discrimination. We need to expand the definition of hate crimes to include false 911 calls made on the basis of race. We need to standardize and enhance training for all police academies. We need to mandate the duty of one officer to report and intervene when another officer is committing uh, misconduct of any kind. We need to require decertification of law enforcement officers who fail to properly perform their duties and of course, to prevent them 
from being rehired in another uh, police department somewhere else in Virginia. We need to strengthen the assessments and vetting required before hiring law enforcement officers. And we need to diversify the Department of Criminal Justice Services uh, Committee on Training so that they can come up with better uh, ways of training our police officers to be more defensive than offensive in their ways of going about policing. Uh, so, so much came out of these hearings and so much of it will be addressed directly uh, on the issue of police reform, on justice reform. Um, and, but like I said, I think the moment is much bigger than that. We have to be able to recognize that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to address uh, the issues of policing, the issues of our justice system, but also to address the things that lead to criminal activity. People not receiving good education is a sure pathway to becoming more likely to be a criminal. People not receiving proper health care is a sure way path to becoming desperate and to resorting for desperate means. Uh, we need to understand that uh, driving on the highway for hours back and forth between work is a serious concern. It causes stress levels to increase tremendously. Mm -hmm. Stress is a direct reason why there's conflict in houses. Domestic violence is a direct result of a lot of these stresses that happen at home as a result of all sorts of things. We need to make sure that uh, women are not uh, paid unequally to men. We need to make sure that uh, people on the basis of race are not paid unequally. We need to make sure that uh, we're, we're providing housing for everybody at an affordable rate that does not exceed 30% of their income so that they can actually live. There's so many things that lead to somebody wanting to take upon themselves criminal activity that uh, we can stem, we can put back, we can hold from becoming true through early preventative measures in the public health systems that we have in place. So important. I mean, you know, you just went through a list of things that we should do, right, to ensure that people have what they need to live their best lives, right, and ensuring people have good education, get paid well, you know, that housing is affordable. I mean, all of these are really big issues, right, and, and seem like common sense issues. Why do you think it's taken us so long as a state and as a country to really address these? Because all of the issues that we've been talking about, while we all know they're important, for whatever reason, the priority isn't always reflected in the state budget. Can you talk a little bit about that? Gosh, uh, you know, it starts off with privilege. I think that's where we need to start with. When, when one has privilege, they don't think about others as much. They don't see the issues of people on the margins. Mm -hmm. And what that leads to is malpractice in governance. Because if you're regularly voting, you're more likely than not to be privileged. And so as such, you're probably electing privileged people. Mm -hmm. I'm privileged to be, to be an elected official, but I'm also privileged in a sense to have been brought up in a lower middle class economic realm. I, I didn't grow up rich. I was forced to live half my life abroad because of discrimination against my father. Uh, there, there are so many things that I got to experience, unfortunately, but have enriched my ability to understand the problems that people face every day uh, that are on the margins. And we need to be able to bring those stories to life. We need to be able to think concertedly about how we can bring in people who are on the margins to the table. Uh, to speak more concretely, we need to make sure that corruption is rooted out of our system. Because we tend to hear a lot more about the complaints that corporations have than the complaints that people have. And when we do hear more of the complaints that corporations have, we, we become sympathetic to their concerns. And with that sympathy, we end up having less dollars to spend 
on public services that are absolutely needed to stem many of the injustices that communities on the margins face. And that starts with reforming taxes. We need to start talking about that at some point. The tax code in Virginia is completely outdated. It hasn't been changed since the 70s. And the top tax rate for the state is 2.5%. And that's, that's, I mean, we're talking about super low numbers there that start also at very low income levels. I can't remember exactly, but I think it's, you, you get to the two and a half percent level at uh, $17,000, $18,000. Uh, taxation isn't my specialty. Uh, I'm not on the finance committee. Uh, however, I do understand that we need money to take care of everybody and that everybody should be paying their fair share that it doesn't make sense for somebody who's living close to the poverty line to be paying the same amount of money in taxes, same percentage in taxes, as somebody who is privileged enough to click a few buttons on the stock exchange and make a million, two million dollars a year, uh, if not more. <laughs> and so uh, I think that there should be uh, a, a reorganization of the way we collect our money because unfortunately in the state of Virginia, we actually are bound by a constitution that does not allow us to use beyond the money that we collect, i.e. we can't loan any money using our wonderful AAA bond rating uh, to fund our budget. So we have a great AAA bond rating that we've worked really hard for in Virginia, but it only goes to infrastructure projects. And not all infrastructure projects are justified, especially the public health infrastructure projects that are extremely necessary for our economic viability in the long term through viability through public health. And so while we don't have the money, we also need to work on restructuring the way we think about our investments as well. Uh, we need to consider the positive impacts on our economy when we have paid sick leave for all workers. Uh, we need to consider the positive impacts of having a public option uh, and in the marketplace on the economy where more people would buy insurance and more people would spend on health care, something that they need and something that will, will generate tax revenue for us in Virginia. We need to think about smart strategies to bring in more money to our economy and to our budgets while also simultaneously taking care of our constituents' needs. And that absolutely starts with tax reform, as I mentioned, and it continues on with a lot of free market economic initiatives that focus specifically on marginalized people, not for everybody, because free market for the rich has been very successful. Free market for the poor has been extremely terrible and we need to work on that. Absolutely, I mean, you brought up some really great points, especially on the budget, right? And, and I think as you, know, you prepare to go back into special session, a lot of these big changes, and obviously the pandemic has caused you know, additional budget issues. How are you going to think about the budget when you go back to Richmond in a few weeks and are wrestling with what can be done and what can't be done? What will your approach be in terms of the budget? Yeah, number one, there's a lot of uh, money that we leave on the table from the federal level. So right off the bat, I'll say that we can use every dollar that the federal government matches for us in our services. I'll be looking to emphasize on reappropriating money to portions of the budget that bring us back dollars from the federal level. And I will make sure that I vote for every single one of those budgetary items that brings back, brings back any dollar back to us uh, from the federal budget. Number two, as I was alluding to earlier, any uh, budgetary item that brings back value to Virginian human life also, while alongside rehabilitating our economy is going to be a, another also top priority as well. Uh, things like health care funding uh, is extremely valuable to an economy uh, especially when it hits two birds with one stone, where you are going to be in a situation where uh, you are healing people and the healing, whether it be from the impacts of COVID-19 or any other disease that is going untreated, 
in Virginian life. Uh, and at the same time, you're going to be increasing spending uh, of constituents, uh, of Virginians, uh, which will bring back revenue at the end of the year to our budget so that we can continue funding uh, for years to come. Well, one of the issues that you've mentioned too that I wanna touch on because it is something I think on the minds of so many Virginians, but also Americans, right? As we prepare for the election in November and here in Virginia, we have them every single year. Uh, but each show, I really like to talk about voting because it is so, so important that everyone gets out to vote. And what is the legislature doing in special session to ensure that Virginians feel safe and like their vote is going to count come November? Such an important question. And I will say that it's still a work in progress mm -hmm. uh, because what we're up against is an unpredictable pandemic. We don't know which way it's gonna take us um, in just a few months even. And we also have yet to fully grasp how, how much of a trouble it's going to be for people to uh, exercise their right to vote. Uh, so how many, how many polls do we need to staff? Uh, but also, how many mail-in ballots are we going to have to send out? How are we going to make sure that people have mail-in ballots, uh, even if they're not asking for it, for example? Uh, is that something that we could do? Uh, there's so many legal questions that we have to talk about. And unfortunately, right now, we're still dealing with the direct impacts of COVID-19 on our economy. And also, we're dealing with a, a huge moment in American history of racial awakening against injustice uh, committed against people of color, Black people specifically. So you can imagine sort of what's going on here. But I think that, uh, you know, we have uh, the means to do it. Uh, I think that people are going to have to uh, sign up for mail-in ballots. They're going to have to request their absentee ballots. Um, we're going to have to do a really good job as legislators to make sure uh, that the people that have voted for us and the people that uh, vote for any elected official, uh, that all the elected officials of Virginia are very active in asking people to request their mail-in ballot. Uh, there's, there's really not many ways around that, uh, kind of at approach. Um, it's, it's, it's worrisome because most people are not ready. Uh, they're not, they've probably never had an absentee ballot requested. Um, that's, that, that's scary. Uh, some people don't know about absentee ballots to start with as a concept. Uh, no excuse absentee voting just was passed in this past right. regular session. Uh, went into effect in July. So it's not a culture in Virginia uh, to automatically think about, oh, I can vote whenever I want, absentee. I think that that culture is going to change just like a lot of things have changed. Uh, it's going to become a new normal. We just have to embrace the work that comes with it. Uh, we have to make sure that people are thinking about it. Uh, we have to use every communication tool we have uh, to make sure people understand that this is extremely important to do. Uh, or else we'll end up with four years of uh, President Trump uh, again. And uh, that's going to have ex irreparable harm on everything, uh, inc not just our democracy and the authoritarian ways of Trump uh, being instilled, but beyond that uh, in our economy that's already sinking and, and it's going to continue to sink with the approach that we're taking to public health. Uh, with the lives of people, 160,000 Americans are already dead and predictably many more to come, to die. Uh, there, there's, there's just so many things to be worried about right now. And, and I'm, not, I'm not sure it's very clear to us how we're going to be dealing with the voting uh, situation, but I think every American is dealing with it. Every Virginia is going to deal with it. And so my hope is that the people on the margins of our democracy are not disproportionately impact in this situation and thus resulting in deep voter suppression that will that may potentially harm them for another four years to come. Absolutely. And and you know, a lot of what we're hearing too, right, is this attack on the postal service, 
So there is even some hesitation that you feel out in the community of voting by mail, right? And making sure that it's going to count, that this attack on the postal service is something that, you know, our votes can overcome. And so I hope that, you know, and during special session that legislators will consider that because I think, you know, the public campaign that needs to go on to ensure people feel safe, but also confident and their vote is so critical right now during this election, because we we do hear every election is the most important one of our lifetime, right? Uh, but this one has a different weight to it, like you described. And so ensuring that people really know that it's safe to vote and they're confident in their vote when they put their ballot in the mailbox is gonna be critically important come November. There's no question. And, and you know the Postal Service being harmed uh, is a deeply problematic situation. Uh, I, I'll tell you, yesterday I was surprised uh, my bail box was extremely full, but the couple of days before that, I didn't get much mail. Mm. And I realized that I think that my my mailman uh, or male woman, I don't know, uh, is coming in with just once, twice a week now uh, to drop off. And, you know, this is already happening in Herndon. And so I'm, I'm already beginning to question what's going on here. Uh, what, how are we going to be dealing with the situation? Uh, automatic sorting machines are being taken out of commission. Uh, that's going to hold back a lot of the services uh, that the postal the postal office uh, uh, usually delivers. So, we'll, we'll, you know, we're we're up against uh, we're up against a, a wannabe authoritarian who gets away with some of his authoritarian means. Uh, at times. And we just are praying right now that he doesn't get away with too much uh, because we really don't have much control over the president. The president is the most powerful person uh, in the United States. Absolutely. And and can you talk a little bit about the gravity of this election? Um, you know, and, and we talk a lot about local politics on the show because, you know, it's so important that people realize that every single election matters. And yes, the presidential absolutely matters in a way this year that feels so much more important even, but also our local elections. I mean, a lot of what we have talked about this evening is where rubber meets the road, right? And it, it's where um, these policy changes affect everyday lives. So can you talk a little bit about how you're going into this election, ensuring that you do everything you can to encourage your constituents, encourage your family members, your community members to get out and vote this year. So important. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to, to, to think of what my role is, uh, given just how big the issue is at large of this election coming into it. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to seem like that. There's, you know, we have this, you know, problem that uh, uh, that is going to take away uh, from our ability to vote. But the enthusiasm gap uh, 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 con may continue to persist. May continue to exist between uh, the the base of the Democratic Party uh, and and the enthusiasm of our, of our of our candidates. Uh, Vice President Biden and Senator uh, Harris, and I think I especially feel it more because I come from uh, I, I'm 28 years old. I come from the the youth generation that was really hoping that uh, Bernie Sanders would be their nominee uh, for the presidency, uh, and it panned out to be that that's not the case. And I I, I absolutely accept it, and and I, I I'm ready to to put uh, President Biden uh, in the White House. Uh, but that means that I have to work with people who uh, look up to me that are not excited uh, for the election. So the way the way I speak about it uh, to folks that are not inspired particularly by the candidate, uh, but rather are uh, hateful of the, or I should say, uh, uh, really wanting to get uh, the current uh, occupant, the candidate for re-election, uh, Donald Trump uh, out of office. The way I talk to them is I, I tell them 
about my story about how just over a year ago, I stood up to Trump at the 400th anniversary of our, what I call a flawed democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, I vowed to myself to stand up to the racist in chief in his authoritarian ways back then. And today I'll continue uh, this work uh, by floating, uh, by, by making sure that, excuse me, uh, I'm renewing my focus to take down this president once and for all, it's specifically by uplifting the Virginians on the margins. And I talk about it from a public health lens so that to remind people that, you know, you, you might be privileged to have good public health uh, at the young age that you are. Uh, but that's not the same privilege that everybody else has that has been facing the wrath of this president. And even if you're not enthused by Biden, that doesn't matter. Uh, your privilege will demand you to make sure that this man is removed from the White House on November 3rd, 2020. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit. I know we just have a few minutes left, but those of our viewers that want to follow you, learn more about what you're doing, uh, especially here on August 18th in special session, tell our viewers how they can best get in touch with you and keep track of all the great things you're doing down in Richmond. Yeah. If you want to get the inside scoop yes. on my office. <laughs> There you go. Make sure to sign up for it was it was passing along underneath uh, uh, on on the lower part. There it is, bit.ly uh, forward slash eighty six sign up. So it's a Bitly link for those that know Bitly, Bitly uh, forward slash uh, eighty six sign up, uh, and that way you'll be receiving my newsletter. It's my weekly checkup uh, for for folks. Uh, you'll well, get used okay. to it every single week. You're, you'll receive your weekly checkup and I'll tell you about what's going on uh, in the world of politics as it relates to you as a Virginian. Uh, and of course, more specifically, Northern Virginia and my constituency out in Herndon, uh, rest in Chantilly and Sterling. That's great. And they can also follow you on Facebook and Twitter. Tell you us can your... follow me on Twitter. You yeah, can totally follow me on Twitter. We talked about before you got a great Twitter. So tell us what your Twitter handle is before we have to say sure. goodbye. It's it's my first name, last name, all one after each other. And it's a, it's, it's a very active venue for you to, if you want to experience uh, Virginia politics live that very day, what's going on and how, how the reactions are playing out and how I use my representative uh, capacity to further the issues of people on the margins for the betterment of all. Well, thank you, delegates, so much for being with us this evening. Thank you for taking all of our, our concerns down to Richmond with you and fighting so hard for not just your district, but for all of Virginia. So thank you for being with us this thank evening. You, and we look forward to seeing you again on the Inside Scoop.